This is the uh, fourth session here of the life of Elijah. We begin now tonight talking about the, the trial of faith. And we've all faced those trials and we'll continue to. 1 Kings 17, verse 2 tells us, The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Kareth, that is before Jordan. I pointed out that it's not was not merely this was not merely for Elijah's protection. It wasn't for a safe retreat. It wasn't designed to protect Elijah from the wrath of Ahab and Jezebel. That the Lord commanded Elijah to leave, but it was primarily to let the northern kingdom of Israel see that God was displeased, I mean sorely displeased with the way they were living. He was really angry at that apostate people up there. And the withdrawal of the prophet Elijah from the scene of public action was an additional judgment against the nation. Because with Elijah's removal, so was the word. And that, as I told you, is a worse drought. And I can't help but point out that tragic analogy, which now exists more or less in Christendom. During the past two or three decades, God has removed some of his eminent and faithful servants, some by the hand of death. And not only has he replaced them by raising up others, in their stead as he does, but he's increasing the number of those which still remain and being sent into seclusion. You know, when we look now, we say, man, so, oh, some of these old fellows that were preaching where they're gone, who's gonna take their place? There will be those. There may not be the majority anymore. They're not like it may have been just 30 or 40 years ago when the predominant teaching was from the Bible, but God will always have his servants. So it was both for God's glory and for Elijah's own good that the Lord told him, get thee hence and hide thyself. You see, what this is, is a call of separation. You know, Ahab was an apostate and his wife, his consul, was a heathen. That nation was in terrible shape. Idolatry was on every side. You couldn't turn anywhere without seeing it. And God was publicly dishonored. He was being mocked. And God will not be mocked. And so the man of God could have no sympathy or communion with such a horrible situation. Now, when we talk about separation, God's saying, separate yourself from that system and from those people. Isolation from idolatry, evil, is absolutely essential if we are to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. That's John, James 1.27. Not only separation from secular wickedness, but also from religious corruption, which we see in the Northern Kingdom. You know, they'd set up their own temple, their own way of worship. Now that Baal has come in, it's religious corruption. Ephesians 5.11 says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And that's been true in every single dispensation. Even now for the church, same thing in this dispensation. Now, I remind you that dispensation just basically means household economy. How God dealt with his people, what people on this earth at different times of history. If you're not familiar with dispensationalism, we are dispensationalists. There was dispensation of innocence, of human conscience, human government, of promise, law, grace, and of course the kingdom will be the seventh dispensation. And in every dispensation, that has been the rule. Have no, faith, no works with the unfaithful works of darkness, those unfruitful works of darkness. And yet if you go back, you see 
Every dispensation has failed. God didn't fail. We did. Who failed in the garden? Man. Who failed before the flood? Man. And it's been like that all the way through. So Elijah stood as God's faithful witness in a day when a nation had completely departed from God. And he's delivered his testimony to the responsible head of that nation. Now God says, you retire. Not quit working, but retire from the area. You need to go somewhere. I'm going to show you where to go. You know, to turn your backs on all that dishonors God is an essential duty for the Christian. But where was Elijah to go? Where was he to go? He had previously dwelt in the presence of the Lord of Israel, where he said, before whom I stand. And he could say when he pronounced that judgment against Ahab, I stand before God. And he should still abide in the secret place of the Most High. That's where he's going to be. Wherever he is, that's where he's going to abide. You know, God was always with Elijah. Whether God led him on top of Mount Carmel or whether God took him to Egypt or where, wherever he took him, he put him on a raft in the Mediterranean, God was going to be with him. So Elijah was not left on his own. He didn't have to devise somewhere to go. He didn't really have a choice. He was directed by God, a place of God's own approval. And it was outside the camp, if you will, away from the entire false religious system. God took him completely away from that. The generate Israel, the northern kingdom, was to know him only as a witness against themselves. Elijah came. He condemned us. He told us what was happening. And he was at that point to have no, take no place or no part in either the social or the religious life of that nation. He was to turn eastward, the quarter from which the morning sun rises. For those who are regulated by divine precepts, you shall not walk in darkness, but you shall have the light of life. Why? That's why he's heading east. He is heading toward the light. People say, don't walk toward the light. Yes, you walk toward the light. Walk toward the Lord. So he's by the brook that is before Jordan. Jordan was the boundary, the very limits of the land of Israel. Typically, it is spoke of, of death and spiritual death that, that now rested upon Israel. That northern kingdom is not going to last a whole lot longer. But what a message of hope and comfort the Jordan really was, because it contains, for the one who is walking with Lord, hope. You know what the Lord has done in the past. You know, when you have a heart of faith, you have a healthy condition. It was the place, the Jordan was the place where God had shown Himself strong on behalf of His people in the days of Joshua, wasn't it? It was not the Jordan, the very scene which had witnessed the miracle working power of God at a time when Israel had left the wilderness wanderings to go into the promised land. It was there the Lord had said unto Joshua in Joshua 3, 7, This day will I bring to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. There at the Jordan River. It was there that the living God made the waters to stand upon a heap so that the Israelites passed over on dry ground. I have a feeling that as Elijah was leaving the northern kingdom, heading toward the Jordan, all those things were in his mind. If his faith in God, and it was, his heart would be in perfect peace, knowing that the miracle working God would not fail him. But you know, remember one thing, Elijah is a great prophet, but he's a man. And we're going to see as we go through this line, he has weaknesses too. Just as Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and you name it, they all had problems, they all had weaknesses. But every weakness brought them closer to the Lord and made them stronger. You see, it was for 
Elijah's own good that the Lord told him, hide thyself. He didn't, you know, if God said, you stay there and you preach the gospel, you preach the word, he would have been protected. But God says, you hide yourself. And he was in danger from another quarter than just the fury of Ahab. The success of his prof uh, profound judgments for the Lord that he gave there could prove a snare, tending to fill his heart with pride and even harden him against the calamity that was coming upon that people. That's an easy thing to, to happen. You know, we saw that previously Elijah engaged in secret, fervent prayer. And then for a brief moment, he had a, a good confession, a good witness before the king. The future would hold for him more honorable service, there's no doubt about it. But for that day to come when he should witness for God, not only in the presence of Ahab, but he should uh, discomfort and utterly rout out that assembled host of Baal, in measure at least, and he's going to turn that wandering nation back to God the Father. But the time was not ripe. Neither was Elijah himself. You know, if you have cataracts, the doctor can't take them off till they're ripe. That's the same thing with Elijah. God said, until you are ready, God's going to work with this man. Elijah needed further training in secret if he was going to be personally fitted to speak against God in public. The man whom the Lord uses has to be kept low. Severe discipline has to be experienced by him. The flesh has to be mortified. Three more years must he spend in seclusion. That's humbling. Here's a man who has been called of God. He went immediately. He stood before the king. Now he's humbly in seclusion. Sadly, you know, how little is man to be trusted? How little is he able to bear being put into a place of honor? You know, how quickly, because of our egos, the self rise to the surface and the instrument is ready to believe he is something more than the instrument. Pride will make us look at ourselves as if we are accomplishing what God's doing. It's sad, but it's easy to make that very service for God that He entrusts us with a pedal, a pedestal that we step up on and make a display of ourselves. You see it all the time, people. They're, what God does, they take credit for it. But I want to tell you something. God does not and will not share his glory with another, even his servant. Therefore, does he hide those who may be tempted to take some of the credit, some of the glory to themselves? Elijah may have been thinking that away. I don't know. But God is bringing him down some. It's only by retiring from the public view and getting along with God that we can learn of our own nothingness. Because we have to, we're nothing. If you take God out of the equation, we are nothing. Elijah, you have to learn that. We see this important lesson brought out very plainly in Christ dealing with his disciples. In you know, one occasion, they returned to him, they were all excited with success and full of themselves. And over in Mark 6, 30, Jesus, they told him all these things, what they had done, what they had taught, what we have done, what we have taught. But if you go to verse 31, the Lord, in a very quiet response, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. You need to get off your high horse and come out here and realize who is behind all this, who is doing it. It's not you. You're an instrument in God's hands. 
And I'll tell you, this is still a gracious remedy for any of his servants who may get a little bit puffed up thinking about their own importance. And I imagine that his cause upon the earth would suffer severe loss. If I remember, oh, that's what, if I moved, oh, it's going to be a loss in this world. But I want to tell you something. If God would remove this servant, he's going to bring another one in. No one is irreplaceable. You just need to understand who it is that's doing these things. God's often said to His servants, get thee hence and hide thyself. Sometimes it's by dashing their hopes in the ministry. Sometimes it's a bed of affliction or maybe it's bereavement. But the divine purpose is going to be accomplished. God uses whatever He needs to use. And you can be happy in the heart when you say, the will of the Lord is done. Like, it is well with my soul. Every servant of God needs, he has to pass through a great number of trying experiences. Just like Elijah by the brook here. If he's going to ever be ready for the triumph of Carmel. You know, in a few years, Elijah is going to stand before all those prophets of Baal and put them to shame because of God. You see, this has been an unchanging principle of the Lord's throughout Scripture. Think of Joseph. He suffered the, undig the indignities of being thrown in the pit, thrown in prison before he became governor of all Egypt and second only to Pharaoh. Moses spent a third of his long life on the backside of the desert before God gave him the honor of leading his people to freedom. David had to learn the sufficiency of God's power on the farm before he went forth and slew Goliath before that assembled army. So it was also true of someone else. Have you ever thought about the fact that our Savior spent 30 years in seclusion and silence before he began his public ministry. It's a principle that we see laid out for us. So too it, it, with the chief ambassadors like Paul. He had a season of solitude in Arabia and his apprenticeship with the Lord before he became the apostle of the Gentiles. But there's yet another angle from which we need to contemplate this seemingly strange order, get thee hence and hide thyself. It was for a very real and severe testing of Elijah's submissiveness to the Lord. He had to show he, he was submissive to the divine will of God. In other words, you have to take that pride and that ego and push it away. Hard to do. Severe for the robust man. This request has to be something terrible. He has to really fight the urge to stay because I'm sure that after he had stood before Ahab, he really would like to spend that three years up there telling the country about God. In the case of Elijah, the testing is obvious. The reason is obvious. He must learn to personally render obedience unto the Lord before he is qualified to command anyone else in the Lord's name. Let's take a closer look at the particular place that God chose to send His servant where He was going to sojourn by the brook there. Notice it was a brook and not a river. Now you say, what's the difference? Well, a brook, we call them around here creek, I guess. That creek can dry up. That brook can dry up in an instant where a river will go for a long time. You know, it's rare that the, God placed His servants or His people in the midst of luxury and abundance. It's amazing. He doesn't do that. Why? Because if we are overdone, overgiven, have too much of the, the things of the world, it only means that it's drawing us away from the affections of God. We have too much, we forget about God. We have too much, we begin to depend on what we have. 
How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? In our hearts, God requires, it's our heart. That's what he wants. And often this is put to the proof. You know, the way in which temporal losses are born generally manifests itself in the difference between a real Christian and the world. The world is utterly cast down when there are financial reverses. Oh, when the stock market crashes or they, they start losing their money, what happens? You read a lot about suicides. Why? Because everything they place their hope in is gone. They have nothing left to live for. Their God is dead. In contrast, the genuine believer may be severely shaken and for a time deeply depressed, but he's going to recover his poise. He's going to say, God is still my portion. I shall not want. Instead of a river, God gives us a brook, which may be running today and it might be dried up tomorrow. Why? It's to teach us not to rest on our blessings, but in Him and Him alone. Don't trust your billfold, trust God. Yeah, it's not uh, easy at this very point that we often fail. Our hearts being far more occupied with the gifts than with the giver. What the, your toes starting to hurt yet? Mine are. This is the reason why the Lord will not trust us with a river. Because it would take his place in our hearts. Deuteronomy 32, 15 says, Jerusalem waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxed fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. He had so much that he forgot about God. He's depending on himself and what he has. And that same evil tendency exists within each and every one of us. We sometimes feel that we're being harshly dealt with because God gives us a brook rather than a river, a Volkswagen rather than a Cadillac. But this is because we are so little acquainted with our own hearts. God loves his own too well to place dangerous knives in the hands of an infant, isn't he? God loves us too much. How was Elijah to subsist in such a place? Where was the food to come from? He is in what we say, the middle of nowhere. He's in a place that makes down in Grundy look like a metropolitan area. He's nowhere. God's going to see after that. He will provide for Elijah's maintenance. 1 Kings 17, 4 says, And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. God undertook this for Elijah. Whatever what may be the case with Elijah, Ahab and all those idolaters up there, Elijah shall not perish. They're going to be thirsty up there in the northern kingdom. God says, you're going to have a brook. I'm going to make sure you have something to drink. In the very worst of times, God shows himself strong on our behalf because we are his. We belong to him. Whoever starves shall be fed. Isaiah 33, 16 says, Blessed shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. The word of God. Yet, how absurd does it sound to our common sense to bid a man to go and stay indefinitely by brook. That would take a lot of faith to go somewhere and stay like that. But it was God who had given the order and the divine commands are not to be argued about but obeyed. Why do we argue with God? Why do we, don't tell me you haven't argued with him. 
I know better than that. Why don't we do that? Wish I had a good answer, but I don't. So Elijah was bidden to trust God contrary to sight. There it is. Walk by faith, not by sight. He had to trust God to reason and, and with all outward appearances to rest in the Lord himself and to wait patiently for him. Grant me patience, but hurry, right? That's the way we are. He needs the patience of the Lord. First Kings 17, 4. I have commanded the ravens to feed thee. Hmm. I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. See that little word there? I left it out the first time. I want to add it the second time for emphasis. To feed thee there. You don't have to call Grubhub to bring you something to eat. You don't have to order pizza. The ravens are going to deliver the food to you there. Elijah might have preferred some other hiding place, but by the brook, he had to go if he wanted to receive divine supplies. As long as he stayed there, as long as God had him tarry there, God had pledged to provide for him. Why worry? How important then is the question, am I in the place which God has by his word or province assigned me? Am I where God wants me to be? If so, he's going to supply every single one of your needs. If like the younger son, you turn your back on him and journey to a far country, then like the prodigal son, you are certainly going to suffer some, some pain. No doubt. And how many servants of God have labored in some lowly, difficult area and the dew of the Spirit was on his soul and the blessing of heaven was on his ministry? And then there came a, an invitation from a bigger church with more people going to pay you more money give you more benefits. And he yielded to temptation. The spirit was grieved because that's not where he was supposed to be. And his usefulness for God's kingdom came to an end. God was supplying his needs where he was. And the same principle applies with equal force to every rank and file of God's people. They must be in the way, Genesis 24, 27, of God's appointing if they are to receive. God supplies. That will be done, if you go back to the disciples' prayer, proceeds, give us this day our daily bread. He's going to provide. That will be done. How many professing Christians have you actually known who have resided in a, a town where God sent one of his own qualified servants who fed them with the finest wheat and their souls prospered. Then came that tempting business offer and from some distant place. And, Boy, it's going to improve my position in the world. They accepted the offer just like a, some pastors do. His tent was removed and he entered the spiritual wilderness where he had no edifying ministry at all. It's the same for an individual Christian. God puts you where He wants you to be if you'll only open, listen and, and follow. You know, when they do that, your soul starves. Your testimony for Christ is ruined. And your period of fruitless backsliding begins. As Israel had to follow the cloud in order to obtain manna, when the cloud moved, they better move or they wouldn't have any manna in the morning. So we must place God's ordering of our souls. If we want them watered, fed, we must obey. Now I want to view the instruments that God selected to minister into the body of His servants' needs. I have commanded, commanded the ravens to feed thee. Various lines of thought are suggested here about this. First, we see both the high sovereignty of God 
and the absolute supremacy of God, his sovereignty in choice made, his supremacy and his power to make good. He is the law unto himself. Whosoever the Lord, whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places, Psalm 135, 6. He prohibited people in the law from eating ravens. It's an unclean animal. Yet, it, it, it was going to be an abomination to them according to Leviticus 11.15 and Deuteronomy 14.4. Yet, God himself made use of an unclean animal to bring food to his servant. That's interesting, isn't it? How different are God's ways from ours? We would never have thought of using an unclean animal to bring food to a servant. God employed Pharaoh's daughter, a pagan, to take care of an infant Moses and Balaam to, to utter the most remarkable prophecies. He used the jawbone of an ass in the hand of Samson to slay the Philistines and a sling and a stone in a young man's hand to vanquish a giant. And he says, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee. Oh man, what a, what a God is ours. The fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, the beasts of the field, even the winds and the waves obey him. Isaiah 43, beginning at verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, yes, even the ravens too. Because I give waters in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my people. It was the Lord who caused that bird of prey, which lived on dead carcasses, to feed the prophet. Wow, let's admire the wisdom of our great mighty God as well as his power. You know, Elijah's fare was provided for partly a natural and a natural and a supernatural way. There was water in the brook. All he had to do was go and fetch it. You know, God will work no miracles to spare man trouble. God will work no miracles to spare man troubles. He doesn't want man to be listless and lazy and make no effort to procure on his own, his substance. God doesn't do that. But there was no food in the desert. He had water, but who was Elisha going to get food? God was going to furnish it in a miraculous manner. He commanded the ravens to feed him. Had human beings been used to take him food, that may have divulged his hiding place. Seeing someone daily in a caravan going out, people would have said, wonder where they're going. And his seclusion would have been interrupted. Had a dog or domestic animal gone out each morning and each evening, the people would have watched that regular journeying of the animals carrying food. They'd have been curious. They would have investigated. But birds whether it's a raven or what, flying with flesh in their mouth over the desert would arouse no suspicion. It would be, you know, oh, they're just taking food to their young. People would just ignore it. So we see how carefully God takes care of His people and how to the finest detail He carries out the arrangements that He makes for them. He knows what would endanger their safety and He knows what would provide their safety accordingly. Think about it. God is in control of that bird. I have thyself by the brook. I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Go immediately, Elijah. Don't entertain any doubts. 
go without any hesitation. And contrary to our natural instincts, this may have been done. These birds of prey shall obey the divine order. I'm sure Elijah's trying to figure, how in the world is he going to do this? You know, we never have to figure that what God is doing is unlikely. With God, all things are possible. God <laughs> created them and gave them a peculiar instinct, and He knows how to direct them. He knows how to control them. He has power to suspend or check that thing according to His good pleasure. Nature is exactly what God made it. And it's entirely dependent upon Him for its continuance. He upholds all things by the word of His power. In Him and by Him, the birds and beasts as well as man live, move, have their being, and therefore He can, whenever He thinks fits, either suspend or alter the law which He has imposed on any of His creatures. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Acts 26 8. Why should it be incredible? Why should it be incredible that God can use this animal? So there he is in his lowly retreat. There's Elijah. He was called to sojourn many days, but he had the promise of God guaranteeing his substance, supplying him with all the needed of his life, all the divine needed things. The Lord's going to take care of his servant while he hid him from public view and he would daily feed him by his miracle working power. But nevertheless, all of this was a real testing of Elijah's faith. Who ever heard of such instruments being employed? Birds of prey bring food in time of famine. Could ravens really be dependent upon? Was it not far more likely that they would devour the food themselves than to bring it to Elijah? But Elijah's trust was not in the bird. It wasn't in the raven. But in the sure and certain word of him that cannot lie. I have commanded the ravens. His faith is not in the bird, it's in the, God, the Lord. It was the Creator, not the cre creature. The Lord Himself, and not the instruments that Elijah's heart was fixed upon. Your heart is blessed when you lift it above the circumstances and you focus on the inerrant promise of God that is sure and solid. 